All right. Well, hello. Uh, good morning, Richard. I don't know if it's evening or morning for you. You're <laughs> so whatever <laughs> time it is for any of you globally, welcome <laughs> to your appropriate time. Um, this is the Chaos University OSPO working group meeting, so it's nice to have you here. Um, we also just, so people know, we just had a really nice um, meeting prior to this on the UN SDGs, uh, which I think a lot of university folks have an interest in as well. I just wanted to kind of point that out. We're talking about how metrics and technology can play a role in helping achieve the UN SDGs. We're not sure what this will look like in any way, shape or form yet, but I think that's what this conversation is about in the meeting that's prior to this. Uh, yeah, Stephanie. Yeah, actually, I wanted to make that, but I realized I wouldn't, wasn't going to be able to make both meetings today. So um, if we do have time at the end, um, if you could yeah, just give a quick recap of where, like where you are in that, that because I do think there's some overlap between, potential overlap between the two. Um, yeah, I think there's overlap group. too. We can talk a little bit about it right now. Um, it's, you know, it's funny because I think Saeed had been bringing these SDGs up to this group, <laughs> like, you know, maybe... <laughs> what feels like a year ago. Um, so it's nice to see him getting some traction. Um, David, are you on right now? I see you're muted and off camera. And eating. <laughs> Stuffing my face right now with it's a bit. It's been uncovered. The I like that waitress that comes in right when. Mm. <laughs> How's your lunch doing? Um. Yeah, um, yeah, we're still in the early days. This is our second meeting, um, third if you count the unconference that that happened in Europe. Um, I think we still have some really good. Um, it's a good group. We had about fifteen people on the call today, I think, and even more the first the first day, the first meeting. Um, so, we are trying to figure out our scope, our mission, our goals, um, but we have participation from Michael Downey from the UN. Um, we had a really good presentation by Cassie Wynn um, um, today, like a deep dive into what what an SDG is, what they are, what the targets are, um, which was really helpful. Um, and people like Jonathan Starr are very active. So I think we have, we have a lot of good. Um, and then there's the uh, Ruth who's helping me run it um, uh, from chaos side and Elizabeth as well. And um, we've, we've, we've just set up our first GitHub doc where we're, we're letting people jump in and discuss the, um, the scope and the mission and being very collaborative about it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's early days. Um, I think it's going to be fun, but I think we're kind of aligning in, in the goal and the, the priorities that we have together. So I'm, I'm excited for the work. And you recorded that, right? So we can look at the earlier meetings mm -hmm. we weren't able to make them. Yeah, and I have the minutes too, but I can, I don't know that we took a ton of notes today. It was more conversation. Um, um, maybe I didn't take any notes. I, I I mean, I took actually a lot of notes, but I didn't take them in the meeting. Okay. Notes, so in, in the uh, I, maybe I'll add them in, but maybe not. I'm not sure. Okay, up to you. But we yeah. also just did a round robin and had everybody, everybody introduce themselves um, and talk about, you know, what they're hoping to get out of the the working group, which I think was very enlightening, but also something I, I don't think we're going to do every meeting. It was just sort of a, in the early days. Do you, did anybody else from the UC camp? camp Allison was there. Um, in, oh, sorry, in, the UCs. Oh, in the UCs. Um, no. Okay. I'm trying so. to. I'm trying to get uh, UCLA folks are interested in this, so I can make sure that they get on. I mean, particularly. Yeah, we'd, love, we'd love to have them. Angela and, and Allison from the Academic Ospos have attended. Um, so we have some good Ospo, Academic Ospo <laughs> connections. Mm -hmm. And then people like, um, actually, Remy the Cosmaker came today and, and had two of his digital core members also show up which was which was cool awesome cassie from the who was there she kind of gave the let us on the deep dive yeah 
So it's, it's fun. Really, it's a fun it's group. A group of people. My personal goal is to have somebody from every continent. We're not quite there. Oh, that'd be awesome. <laughs> Actually, over I just... representation from the U.S., of course. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, good. Anybody else on that? Allison, I think just I think you got it right, David. Just in terms of kind of what, what we're doing here, so love to have more people there. It's a good group. Um, okay. Um, I so for those of you that weren't here um, last time, we had a great presentation kind of on thinking about sustainability with respect to um, the grants. And so it's, it was a good conversation. It, it's made me think quite a bit, just a bit about um, what people are, are actually measuring um, at their universities with respect to open source activity. So I, I, would, I would love to just kind of hear from folks now that you've all been in your OSPOs for a year now, some quite a bit longer, but some relatively shorter. I'm kind of curious as to this set of questions we have here. Um, like at your own OSPOs, are you using metrics to, to demonstrate the work that you're doing within your university? Like with like to to represent your own OSPO, are you using metrics in any way to to kind of help demonstrate the work that researchers are doing within your university? I'm just I'm curious what you're what you're all measuring at this point or helping people measure. Or is it just about helping people understand the enterprise of open source? <laughs> like, here's what open source is. Let me just explain it to you. So you just, so people have a better understanding. Yeah, Stephanie. I'm happy to kick off a little bit. Um, yeah. Um, and I'm sure I'm gonna forget stuff because I feel like I was just writing up a note to like a final report going, you know, what are your challenges? And my challenges was- And it's perfect I, timing. And I, and I wrote up and my 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 subheading for that, which I changed ultimately, but before I, but it was how, learning how to say no is kind of- Oh like yeah. My, Actually, I wanted I'm the to chair say yes. of somebody's no committee here at my <laughs> university. So. Yeah, that's it. That's how you, that's, I was gonna say that. And I think that's what I was finding, but I think for the metric side, um, I, right now we're having we're working with Jonathan at, and all the other UCs and then like people like Michael over at, that with, that works with Angela to try and come up with like the landscape uh, understanding our landscape of open source and um, once we have that I feel like we're going to probably be using more of the metrics that we talk about here um, in evaluating um, the different actual like what's going on on those different projects and that different activities. So we have a so we're kind of kind of first finding it and then going to implement metric. At least that's like kind of our plan and the way that we're we're um, structuring that activities for a specific open source work that's going on on campuses, um, long like in the midterm. But uh, and uh, but prior to that, we kind of have a list and a couple lists, but it seems to be project by project and like proposal by proposal so for us right now when it comes to like how, you know how are you going to measure success? And we're like, well, here are our metrics. <laughs> We're going to use so that it's helpful that we have these discussions because then it helps us refine those um and i think once we get to the stage where we have we feel like we have the data we need to kind of really look at um the different projects uh individual activities that are actually occurring like say an open source project or some sort of open collaboration going on on campus that we can use the community metrics and community health metrics in particular um, on that. Um, we also, yeah, we also point people a lot to this when they're trying to come, like, say you have a pose, somebody has a pose project and we're helping them with writing the proposal, we're pointing them to chaos and other, and other, you know, depending on if something like uh, other aspects that might help them, um, to get them kind of started to understand what they should be measuring. Um, and then I think for just larger discussions with regards, we're still kind of a, even though we've been doing this for a few years, I feel like we're still in the opening stages of trying to get the campus to kind of see what to understand what they're looking at when they're looking at open source and open collaborations and things and what the value and what what success looks like with that sure. so um that's just i mean 
that's kind of still a work in progress. But at least with the individual, like the activities of different researchers, we we have a we have a pathway forward at this point. So can I make a few comments? One is um, on the, the landscape. Is this the landscape of projects that are UC related in some way? Like they originate from mm. UC? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the the lands. So all of the campuses. In the, the campuses are involved in the Sloan grant that we have right now. Um, that's all six of us are collaborating with NumFocus in particular. And then like we pulled in, like I said, UTA or some of the discussions among others. Um, so uh, we, um, but what we're individually doing or what, sorry, what we're doing as a group, like in the, in, in the network is, um, is yet doing a landscape of of what is originating out of UC, uh, the UC campus is involved in those six of us. Uh, the ultimate goal is to have that then something that other campuses can also use once they're interested in kind of being part of the collaboration. Is this what you're doing to Angela at UT, like trying to map the open source projects that originate from UT Austin or maybe the UT system? Sorry, I can't. I hear you. <laughs> oh, you do. You hear me? Great. Yeah. Um, because I can't. I can't get the actual frame of Zoom to come up. So all I see is the like join a workspace. Uh, well, you, we see you, and we see your background, and we hear you just fine. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Um. So yes, what we're doing, what we've done with our discovery process th thus far, is we've looked around campus and we've we've seen like who's doing an open source project. And then what we're doing is we're taking that and we're connecting with the teams that have, we're starting with the, the teams that have the biggest number of people. And we're connecting with those teams to talk about, you know, trainings, what we can offer, how we can support the activity, the open source activity going on on campus. So we're using it as a tool to leverage connection and then eventually provide services. Um, that's, that's our goal and ours. And then if we could do this, um, and this is like a second phase of the project, understanding any increased participation, um, particularly areas of increased participation, whether that's in sort of, you know, maintenance mode or contribution mode or creation of new projects, observing that. And then if we could grapple with sort of like downstream publications or productivity off of these open uh, source projects, we would want to get to that. We're not that advanced yet, um, but those would be our goals. Okay. Um, do you, do either of you care about, is anybody else doing this type of mapping on the column? Maybe Allison, you had said- Yeah, yeah, just, is it similar? Was, yeah, I think, you know, we're in a similar place with um, trying to assess the landscape and what people are doing um, so we can craft um, relevant metrics and best meet the needs okay. of um, how our community is functioning in open source. So yeah, just ditto to, to everything okay. that's been and it's said. the same. It's like the projects that are originating at Mass. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, and specifically, you know, building community, not just among um, people interested in learning about open source or using open source, but practitioners of open source, okay. um, developers. Um, do any of you care about projects that I see your hand clear? I'll finish my question. Um, do any of you care about projects that maybe didn't originate at UT or Madison or UC Santa Cruz that your researchers are active participants in, but they, they don't have roots? Your... Yeah, I we do. I mean, we are looking at that as well. I mean, okay. I, I think we're, we're starting with stuff that's originating, but hoping that some of that okay other stuff comes out as well. And then I think the next stage is okay. to. I mean, okay. the bigger the project, the bigger project, I think it's coming up more readily. Like, okay. Will... Yeah, I mean, like we're it's... definitely curious about that. That was one of our survey questions in our community survey is like, what do you use? Um, and I keep track of, you know, events okay. and, and workshops and things around um, software on campus. Like there's one in the statistics department for Julia. Um, and so it's like, okay, they're using Julia in the statistics department, okay. just keeping track of that. Um, but in, at the moment, fairly informally. Okay. Um, okay, cool. That's helpful. That, that's helpful up here. I have questions down below, but Claire, why don't you go ahead and 
ask your question or make your comment. Yeah, it's, it's completely different now. So I don't want to, um, uh, it was, it's just a new area that Lero are looking at that I'd never heard of before. So I, I wanted to share it here because, yeah. um, because it's new, um, but, uh, but is, is that okay to, to, yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. So, yeah. So I'll, I'll give, I'll give some context and then I'll put some notes in, but, um, so in Ireland, uh, the, they have decided to completely disrupt the research and innovation grant system. So we did have a body that funded all our research institutions, of which Lero is one. Um, they've now reformed that. It had to go through Parliament and everything. They've they've created a new body with a new scheme and a new strategy. And in the new strategy, it's completely disrupting all the research institutions. So this is both very disruptive for everyone involved in Ireland, but but also an opportunity, I guess, in terms of um addressing what might be a new set of research institutions come you know 2026 say um but the reason why i'm bringing it up is because i i was having lero as well we were having a look at from the ospos perspective we were having a look at the actual um strategy document um that that all this in this um money is going to go to to deliver and they kept referring to this global innovation index um, I don't know if people are familiar with that. So it was it's essentially my understanding it's 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 an actual um index that's been done by the IP, the World IP organization. And therefore it does not surprise me to learn or will not surprise you to learn that it's got it's a real big focus on IP licensing and patents as being innovation as uh, like indicators of innovation impact. There doesn't seem to be much space in the in the very high level ranking for open source outputs as being a, a valid um, uh, output, even though there's loads of references to, wouldn't it be great if we get collaborations between industry and universities and we really want to foster innovation ecosystems. I mean, basically everything that open source does better, but then they kind of, they say all the right things and then they go, we'll measure it through IP licensing and, and patents, which is, I think, a flaw in the argument, but that's where we're going with this. So. I, I just I'm going to kind of I did read the Global in Innovation Index and then they 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 did have like kind of, you know, other indicators of success like collaborations, for example, or, you know, software use and things like that. And so I suppose the, the, the reason why I'm bringing this out is because this is our national strategy. And if there was an opportunity to maybe get some insight into how open source outputs could map to the Global Innovation Index. That would be very useful, at least for us. But I'm assuming that other people are being hit by this too. Like that, this it's not just Ireland and the folks in Irish universities that are looking at this global innovation index. Um, and I, it, I think it would be very interesting to see how we think about open source in that context, because it would, like for us anyway, it would help us kind of make the case for we invest in open source in all our academic institutions. We therefore can rise up in this in this index. That would be a good thing and could probably be used to actually justify more investment. That's interesting. I had not I have not heard this. Um I couldn't help but kind of um like laugh to myself because this is what universities do sometimes. They say one thing and then the measures are quite different than what is put on the web page. <laughs> so right. Uh, make a big impact on the world, but just publish in these three journals, you know, <laughs> kind of, kind of story. <laughs> um, okay. That's interesting. Has anybody ever, has anybody else heard of the global innovation index at all? Has it come across? I have not. Um, it immediately made me think about the UN stuff that we're talking about in the meeting prior, like how it would map there. Um, Stephanie, can I, ask you a question too. Uh, sure. Um, so you had also mentioned beyond the landscape that you're working project by project and proposal by proposal to help say groups think about um, maybe proposal by proposal, like think about sustainability, how they might go about measuring the success of their project as they move forward over the course mm -hmm. of three years. Kind of like the conversation we had with Jeff two weeks right. ago. <clears throat> are, are there things that you're that you're kind of encouraging them to look at? Is it pretty random when you talk to different groups? No, I don't think it's random. I think um, I think it, it's, but it is a case by case in the sense of like, okay. you look at what they're, like, I mean, okay. If I think of like a post, like a post grant, mm -hmm. just because yep. those are the ones that are fresh in my mind. Um, 
that it would be okay how do you how are you measuring community like size and then how are you going to discuss in your proposal community like how you um engage your community and like what what metrics you're going to use for that so then i you know we looked at we again we point like it's very okay. I, it's helpful that we there's a couple things we point them to say hey or make sure it's are added if we're how depending on how involved we all are in the proposal itself um but um, I normally try and get them to at least, you know, include things that come from chaos or other language. Um, also, I mean, I've used in the past, like open source way that, you know, Carson Wade put out. I mean, it's a help, helpful guidelines for like at least getting like great language to add, you know, type of things. So, so it really, you know, you understand what your, um, um, what your, uh, you know, um, it, it, that it shows that you have an understanding of it, especially yeah. when it's especially proposed, because I feel like that's very much it's really important for them to show community and understanding of their communities as well. So. Agreed. Is anybody else in their OSPO doing something similar to this where you're working with, say, folks putting together a grant proposal where you might encourage them to think about particular metrics of success? Or not yet. Part of me is wondering um, if there would be value. So Don will probably be mad at me, but I'm going to call it a practitioner in debt or a practitioner guide, but um, that we could have. So Don puts together practitioner guides, which are ways for, say, people to think about how particular metrics could come together and kind of the narrative behind why these metrics are important around a particular topic. Um, and so I'm wondering if, if there would be value in something similar, like a practitioner guide that could be brought forward to proposers of a, of a grant saying, here are, you know, kind of four metrics that you could think about when you're putting together your proposal. Here's how you would observe these metrics over time. And here's how you might understand them in practice. We just we would encourage you to to kind of think about these things when you're putting together your proposal. And I'm wondering if we could do something like that around, say, these engagement metrics that Stephanie had kind of pointed out. Would that be of, of value to anybody just in the sense of like a guy, like helping people kind of take that first step? Like, you, I know you're putting together a proposal or I know that you have this project. Here are a couple things that we think you should think about with respect to to trying to improve the sustainability of of your project over the long run. Would that be at all, or is it or is it too case by case? Do you think? I don't know. I'm curious where you find yourself, Stephanie, when you're talking to groups. Actually, I think it would be helpful. I mean, we I did case by case, but it isn't something that you you just kind of look at and say, hey, this is. Um, this is a good guideline to people, at least that people have a starting point. I think that that's helpful. And then people adjust. It's the same thing we, we have like templates for all of the, you know, non-technical documents that, that are required for, for mm -hmm. a project. So it's like, you know, data management, da, 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 da. this would be a really good, you know, kind of template to start with. And then people like adjust as they, as Let they me, see needed. Yeah. I'll show you. Again, I'm sure. <laughs> Okay, um, I'll show, I'll share this. I'll put it in the chat and then I'll share my screen here. Yeah, like a pattern or a template, Gary. This, a lot of this is, these questions are coming from the conversation with Jeff two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Like just ways that we could think about helping OSPOs kind of work in the upstream. Because right now my, my thinking is that a lot of this work is done say by a, in the post program, trying to help the recipients of the awards understand these things. <laughs> so the post program awardees, as an example, um, get awarded and then they go through 
training to help them think about like long-term sustainability. And as Jeff pointed out, some of it is through open source and then some of it could be through um, like for-profit endeavors. But I, my thought is, is that if we could work a bit in the upstream with the OSPOs to get proposals to think about this before submission, maybe that could be helpful um, for not only your grantees, but for the programs that are actually doing the funding. <laughs> they could take some of the burden off that as well. Um, what, yeah, I was gonna say, and I also think that in integrating this more into that training that you talk about, um, that because I feel like that, like in that particular case, and I think everybody who's had a post grant, at least since year one, People would agree that the the training that you get it's not necessarily um, at you know apropos to to everybody. It's not, not not specifically great for open source. It's useful for some things, but not as good for mm -hmm. those. Whereas I think this would be something that they could they could really like integrate in uh, a little bit more. Um, something that should be part of whatever the training that that the different projects get. And then we the first yep. year I felt that they did, and the second since then. Um, what they've been focusing on is a little bit too SBIR focused and you know like um like very much small you know small you know business, models. Small business focused yes yeah yes. yeah um so what what Don has done here and I think it's it's really interesting just in the sense of of trying to take a look at a couple a couple chaos metrics so contributor absence factor contributors types of contributions and just saying these are really just a, a select set of metrics that could be helpful when thinking about, in this case, contributor sustainability. What she's also done here is kind of provided that narrative of how you might go about diagnosing this or taking a look at what these metrics could mean in practice, more than just saying, here, here are three metrics, you know, knock yourself out and good luck. Um, but really kind of committing to that data science narrative that can, can kind of come with metrics. So the, my thought is, is there may be something here that could be useful, not a bunch of them, but just even just a single guide that could be useful for researchers to kind of think about the sustainability and kind of signal that when they're submitting proposals. We're thinking about their project in the long run. And Dawn, I know you've talked about these before, but if there's anything yeah. that you want to mention. Well, and I, I think the real, um, the real focus of all of these practitioner guides is that step four, which is how you, how you improve your project, um, which is the bit that goes beyond what we've historically done within the chaos project, which is we've, we've thrown metrics at people um, and maybe help them interpret them a little bit, but not really told them what to do with, um, you know, with, with what they have and how they, how they can actually use the data and the ideas to improve their projects. So I think that's kind of the focus of the, the practitioner guides in particular. So I'm not sure how that fits into the, I, I don't understand the grant process well enough to, to know um, whether the practitioner guide format would really fit, but or whether you know things are, whether the grants are so specific that um, I don't I don't know. Yeah, I just don't know enough about grants to know whether this would be appropriate or how it would work, or whether we need some other type of guide entirely. So the practitioner guides I think are a really good example of guides that are useful for people who are brand new to, brand new to open source or um, new to metrics. But we can certainly have other types of guides too for for other things that are similar. My my thought on the guides is is that um, the grant process, like the submission process, would still be the same. Um, when whenever somebody's trying to write a grant, they're trying to get an edge <laughs> to get money, <laughs> so they're trying to find that edge. And and if and if in a grant proposal you can signal that you have put thought into the sustainability of your project beyond the three-year funding cycle, this seems to be something that um, the grant organizations are, are starting to think about pretty heavily. And so if we can do it earlier in the process, the thought would be is that that, that could potentially give an edge to applicants by, by saying, you know, we're gonna do all these great research things. 
we're going to build community. But on top of that, we've also thought about the long-term success of this project, which goes beyond the three year. So that's that was my thinking here. And the thought is, is that that last part of the conversation is one that's starting to happen internal to the grant agencies in supporting their projects. And if we could just move that upstream a bit, that could be beneficial to, to the people who are actually applying to the grants. So it wouldn't really change the grant process, Don. It would change more of, say, what's in the narrative in the grant application or encouraging people in their narrative to think about these parts. Does anybody else be, besides Stephanie helping people in that process? Like I, if nobody else is doing it, then maybe Stephanie and I can just talk offline. <laughs> you know what I mean? And kind of come up with something that could be helpful in her situation. Yeah. We don't necessarily help them with this aspect yet. Oh, sorry, David. No, no, you were you no, were no, talking. Go ahead, Angela. <laughs> But I, I think this is incredibly interesting. And I think it's something I think it's something that would be useful. Okay, cool. Yeah, David. So we we have been having some conversations around this. Um, you know, everybody I don't the metrics I was thinking about are not not chaos exactly, but like I would want to know every grant that uh, that has software you know, in my, in our university, because with the Nelson memo, they're all going to be required to really make that publicly available. So they should be, know how to do that. They should be, know that we have an OSPO to, to help them do that. Um, the only thing we've started doing with grants is, is adding a little commitment letter that just says GW has an OSPO and we're here to help you execute, you know, any of the open requirements that you might have for data software or publications to make it publicly available. So yeah, that's the other thing. And maybe this is not for this group, but we just talked about was how do we get into the OVPR funding line with these new open requirements? You know, if it's, if they have these requirements, you know, can we get 5% of that overhead to go to the OSPO for our own sustainability? I'd be very okay, curious nice. to know if other hospitals are thinking about those kind of things. We're thinking about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I can't say that we have had that discussion with um, our vice chancellor of research in so many words, but I think he gets our gist a little bit. But and we we just have yeah I no I agree I think that's enough I think that's been a discussion with the guards. We actually it'd be a good one for us to have in our general discussion with the, the academic hospitals about how people are approaching that discussion with regards to. How do you get yourself into the overhead costs? <laughs> I mean, to, to to your points, David. So one is, I mean, to, to me, for all for all of the OSPOs at all of your universities, it having um, just written or in the process of submitting a grant myself right now, the facilities page that I have to write. I mean, there should be a paragraph. <laughs> on the OSPOs that says <laughs> this university has an OSPO, which is there to support the activities around open source. I mean, I have a paragraph on my library. I have a paragraph on conference facilities. <laughs> it would make sense to have a paragraph on the OSPO in that in that part. Um, and I, I don't know if people have that right now. Um, do you, okay, you do, Angela, that would, I mean, it makes a ton of sense. It should just be a cut and paste that people can put <laughs> in their facilities letter. Um, yeah, perfect. Um, so that that kind of seems like a like a, a a really good step. I had a second comment on yours too, David, but I don't remember what it was. I was too excited about the facility statement. <laughs> All right. Stephanie, it sounds like you have one too. In the data management. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. What's the date? Why do you have it in the data management plan? Is it about? As far as security. The, now that the security is added to the data management plan. Okay. Because open source security is part of 
Interesting. Not necessarily a service we're offering, but something that we talk about as something that we can help. And support. Okay. Okay. We, we also have it in our DMP template file. And that's just because if you're working with data, you might be working with software and they should all be in the same place. But we have it, our OVPR has a facilities database. We're in there. And then we send it twice a year to our, we have a, a, a research administrators. We send it to them. We send it to our research deans twice a year just to make sure they know that it's out there. And it's on file with development. Like it's everywhere we can get it. That makes sense. That one seems like the, in the DMP, it seems like it would be a little bit more case by case for the different projects, unlike the facilities, but okay. Um, David, I remember the other comment that I was going to make is like getting like inventorying open source on submitted or funded projects. That seems like a, a landscape work that others are doing right now. I don't know if that would tie in there. Um, it seems like asking such a question as part of the grant application process internally to a university might make sense, but changing that process always seems to be impossible. <laughs> so, you know, like the the, app, the internal routing process is what I'm talking about. Even just a, adding a checkbox, it seems like it would be a big headache, but maybe others have had success in doing that. We've asked about it. We haven't gotten it further, but there is, it. yeah, it is actually the... Um... The intake form is what we were hoping to to, to have done, like have an, a, a, and, you know, is open source. I think we originally thought like, do you just put the, you know, is there any discussion about open source software in your proposal? Um, but now I, I agree that since all federal funding, all the software needs to be open source, it's actually probably better just to say is any software being developed within your, and then everything that checks that box, you can go. And that, like I said, that for us, that's intake. Um, is where we were discussing it. That's an easier place to put it. Like intake, meaning it's been awarded. No, no intake in the sense of when the proposal is being written. Oh yeah, every, was, everybody has to yeah. go through that first step. You know, to to yeah, let yeah, yeah. their office of research know they're applying. But, it doesn't um, seem like it would be that much work to just add. Right. A, well, a, the problem is that right when we said that, they also added a bunch of export control related stuff. So oh. all of a sudden, they went from like you know this like relatively short list of things to do to this like ooh totally expansive thing and so okay. but um but yeah there is a pop i think that i mean i i would suggest having that conversation with or uh i we haven't done it yet but um i okay. mean we we've had the discussion we haven't followed through on getting it um gotcha. implemented on there but um that is kind of what we okay. were looking for angela do you have a comment so stephanie are you working with, like you're working with your office of sponsored projects and you're yeah. getting your facility okay and and you yeah so office sponsor project has the template they have the intake form they have all this stuff and so it's just a matter of us sitting down and making sure we have so I we we have a research development person that specifically works with us as part of engineering and yeah. she's been the one that we've been working with to get it integrated into the language and because she knows us the best but then the idea would be that then she could expand that out to you know she's kind of our champion in research development and then um <clears throat> for the OSP the intake form it really should just be like it's just a matter of getting it into the system and i think part of the issue is that they're looking to create a new um uh they're, they're i think they're going to going to to a different new management system and so i don't think they want to make any changes until that's happened because yeah. then they'd have to redo everything but um but yeah so the idea would be just to add it to the that intake form yeah i think that's smart i i mean i'll go for that too yeah david um, I just want to add real quickly that we are also jumping in full force to all the landscaping work. Um, and thank you to Angela's team and everybody else that's that's doing a lot of stuff. In particular, um, Allison, we just launched our survey um, two weeks ago. So, you know, going to keep it open for a couple of months, maybe the end of the semester. But fingers crossed that the survey fatigue is, is overcome and we can get some good participation and maybe aggregate some results. Pretty cool. Um, yeah, that intake on the intake form, it does seem like just talk, listening to all you talked and having just been through it myself, it does seem like it could end up on that compliance page. <laughs> it's just one more check that I have to <laughs> maybe. No, you're right. I just hate compliance. <laughs> yeah, I know. But if you're going to get, I mean, I think if you want to argue for 
the buyback on the grant or whatever you call it, like ours is already really high, but I think it's, you kind of have to be there because then yeah. the university is recognizing you as an essential component in grant. Yeah. So uh, it's not you know, what she just said. <laughs> compliance is a, and compliance is important. They have to pay for it. So if you're part of the compliance process, it is actually a, bo a bonus. So people might not like you as much. But. Sorry, researchers. Hey, we're here to help you, but damn, we're going to make it hard. <laughs> I have to answer a bunch of questions about like animals and stuff on every yeah. proposal that I submit. <laughs> yeah, and that's all I was going to say. And I, I, you know, working in open source and having to fill out the export control stuff is always kind of weird yeah. too. It's like, it's so bad, but, um, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> all right, cool. Uh, well, this is a great conversation. I think maybe what I'll propose is um, I'll kind of, connect with with Don and not on this not to just all of a sudden make a practitioner guide but just kind of wireframe something out I can do that before next time and we could maybe talk about what in the next meeting what maybe a couple metrics could be this is on that guide if somebody's submitting a proposal here are a couple things to maybe think about when you're thinking about the sustainability of your project and what those things could be um, and then maybe collectively we could kind of build out some of the narrative around those things, I think that could be kind of fun. Okay, this is very good. Um, I did wanna, before we go, I did wanna just mention a few dates if you don't know all of these things. Um, I do know that ChaosCon is scheduled for Brussels January 30th, is that right, Don? Or is it the 31st? It's the Thursday, so I think it's the 30th. The 30th yes. on Thursday. 30th and Claire, Thursday. I think you're also running a group that afternoon. Is that right? For this group. So just confirming that we will have a breakout session. I was just typing it in there. We'll have a breakout session for the university working group um, as part of one of the breakouts in the afternoon. So just confirming that. Yeah. So it's an all-day event. If you're going to be in Brussels, that would we'd love to have you there. It's a really nice setting. It's the top of a, you know, a, a, a hotel. It's a really nice view across Brussels. Um, so and then we're going to have a social event that evening as well. So love to have you there. <laughs> it would be great. <laughs> and if you've never been to Brussels, it's a pretty relaxing city. That's for sure. <laughs> I think this time I might, might try to take a train to Luxembourg just to say I've been to Luxembourg. <laughs> just step off and step back on the train. Six hours round trip. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, this is a really great conversation, everybody. I really appreciate it. Um, some some good stuff, and I think we have some things to talk about next time we're here, too. All right? So have a great afternoon, great day. We'll talk to you Thanks. later. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Bye.